there are currently one million unaccounted for Ukrainians. Kherson had a, a population of half a million. When I was there last, it had a population of 50,000. At the start of this, Ukraine's armed forces were about 100,000. They're now a million. The Tsunami people, let's, let's get a bit more about them. Some of the people I've met are doing incredible things out there. Let's face it, they are the most battle-ready army in the world. The biggest donor of tanks to Ukraine is the Russian Federation. There is a there is a massive, massive human cost on both sides of the fence with this, isn't there? They are determined and they are going to get their land back. For a country without a navy, to sink another country's capital ship, the Ukrainian drone operator will go out with five drones in the morning and typically come back with three. Welcome to the debrief, and this week I've got a guy with me, Guy Shepard. I've known him for about a year, and in that time, he spent much of that year in and out of Ukraine. He's a businessman from Hampshire. Guy, how are you, buddy? You all right? Yeah, Phil, I'm really good, thanks. How about you? Brilliant, mate. Brilliant. Listen, you're just back as well, aren't you? Yeah, I got back less than 24 hours ago. Uh, We've uh, been to really? Odessa and back in five days, 6,000 kilometres. Oh, so probably pro shattered. Appreciate you coming in. You look, you look tired. <laughs> how was your trip? It was really good. We, we, we took over a, uh, a 26 ton lorry, um, a, a former builder's merchant one with a big crane on the back, three pretty much brand new quad bikes and wow. some trailers, um, all the way down to Odessa for a, uh, a unit down there. I'll tell you a bit about them in a second. Um, but that will be for delivering supplies, casualty evacuation, and that vehicle is pretty much in service now between Kherson and uh, Bakhmut. Wow. So listen, what I want to do is I'm going to take, take things right back to your childhood introduce, find out a little bit about you, all right? And, yeah. then, and then we'll talk about what you're doing now, because what you're doing now is phenomenal. I, I know some of it, and I can't wait to tell everybody about what you're up to. So, listen, where, where does Guy come from? Where, where was Guy as a kid? Crikey. Well, I was born in Scotland, and uh, uh, mainly because my dad worked for BP, and that was when what was then Grangemouth Refinery. It's now Ineos. Okay. Uh, so I travelled the world a little bit, lived in Canada for a couple of years, lived wow. in London for a couple of years, bit of boarding school, and um, ended up... At school, were, you, were you a clever kid? Uh, I was a difficult kid. <laughs> difficult I, kid. <laughs> Non-compliant, um, but at school I, I I went into the cadet force and, and that gave me immense, immense skills and uh, a lot of value and, and really good training it for It does, the it's a great place and you know, lots lot of people serving today will always refer back to what they first learnt in the cadet force, which is which is a really valuable experience. Absolutely, and you're ambassador for the cadets. In I am an ambassador, yeah, I'm yeah. the champion of the cadet force, which is, yeah, I'm very proud of that to be honest. It's, me, it's, it's, it's putting stuff back as it were for me. So, absolutely, absolutely. So, Grades and that? Did you get good grades? Did you did you did you achieve at school? I I probably exceeded my parents' expectations, um, <laughs> but for, for me it was more about uh, mechanical stuff. About uh, I, I love things like Meccano, taking things apart, breaking them, getting them to work. So the yeah you know, the, the the GCSE English and English literature and Latin and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. It just See you later. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing to do with me. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But give me some some tools or some engineering to do, and then I'm I'm I'm, I'm yeah it, that really gets my interest. Okay, so you came out of school. What was what, what what did you do then? What what was your what was your move on life? Where where did you go? What did you want to do? I very nearly joined the Royal Engineers, and in fact went to a pre RCB in uh, Chatham, um, and and that was a, a really fun experience. I probably went there a year earlier than than I should have done. I hadn't quite grown up enough. Yeah. Um, and with uh, three of the other guys there, we went out in the town and spent a, a couple hours in the brig at the guardhouse uh, <laughs> on the pre RCB. Yeah, well done, nice so, one. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the uh, <laughs> uh, all, all of the uh, the, uh, the tasks and stuff uh, really excelled at uh, you know, the shark infested custard and all that sort of thing that you had to cross. Um, yeah. Absolutely great fun. Um, uh, but I ended up going into civil engineering and construction as a, uh, a career, which okay. was uh, was made my mother a lot happier because this was the days in 1990 of the IRA, and she was convinced I'd get blown up in Northern Ireland. Yeah, a lot, and, lot of people, a lot of people's thoughts were, you know, of, so I, of I, bad I, things over there. So, what sort of? I mean, when you're talking engineering, what what do you actually do? What what's your? What do you build, make? I'm I'm really lucky. I've Every project I've done has been different. So, for example, one in uh, Portsmouth under uh, Gunwolf Quay, building a tunnel under a railway line in one weekend, and that's uh, under a five-track railway line. Um, uh, with uh, other guys, I was part of a project team that built the tallest uh, residential building in Southampton uh, and on the south coast. That's a 30-storey building. Okay, so you, um, do, you, do you design these things, or do you just help in the construction of them? 
It's, it's mainly the construction phase. So uh, okay. the, the design team will be there. Quite often we have to point them. We have to manage that process okay. and make sure they stick to the brief. Architects like putting extra liners on a piece of paper or looking something a bit more expensive and shiny and glittery than they need. <laughs> so, we've got a, got so you put the manager. reality into their into their drawings. You're like, no, no, mate, I don't go together like that. It ain't never going to work. Absolutely. And they like spending <laughs> other people's money with uh, their someone else's I'm sure they do. Yeah. I'm sure they do. Yeah. So you've been doing that for a number of years. A number of different projects all around the country? Very much, yeah. Um, uh, crikey, most of the southern home counties, so stuff in Heathrow, Chatham, um, big big shopping centre in Chatham. Actually, that, that yeah, we shut the Medway Tunnel on that one when we dug up some uh, ordnance and uh, we had BBC helicopter flying over the top, top bomb disposal on site. <laughs> and uh, it turned out to be from about uh, 19, uh, 1664. It was uh, an 1664? old bomb. 1664? Yeah, it was from when the Dutch invaded the Medway. It wow. Was one of the very first phosphorus bombs uh, that was ever made. I think it was the, the Mad Prince von Ludwig. And we dug <laughs> the scene up. And um, and it, yeah, it caused chaos for about, I bet it probably did. about five or six where's hours. The, where's, the, where's the manual for that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not. It's certainly not in the British Army Bomb Disposal Guide. I think I'm it sure predates that not, one. No. So it's, um, <laughs> but, Stumped. So look, listen, the Ukraine stuff is what what I really predominantly, although I could talk about your other stuff for days, I'm sure, but predominantly I brought you in to talk about the Ukraine stuff. How did you how did you get involved with Ukraine? What 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 triggered you to disappearing over and, and doing what you're doing now? Well we'll get to where you are now, but what early days of Ukraine, why? For sure. I think I think there's two reasons. The first is um as you know, I collect uh, British military history um yeah. from largely World War Two to to current day, so I've got and just to, it, it's not a couple of smocks and a and a jumper somewhere, is it? It's just it's, it's your, your collection, top top to bottom, in a, in a, in a twenty second brief. What okay. You got? Uh, 1966 Pink Panther, 1990 SAS Desert Patrol vehicle, Gulf War One. Um, I've got two Wimmicks. One of them is uh, a, a green uh, green Wimmick that's currently in Ukraine on the front line. Free loan to them for as long as they need it. Having given them that one for as long as they need it, and it may not come back, um, <laughs> I went out and bought another one because I wanted to keep the three military yep. Land Rovers. Uh, so I've got a Pathfinder uh, Wimmick. Oh, wow. Uh, so that's uh, that's at home. Uh, there's a uh, 1974 Sabre uh, CVRT. Can't call it a tank because it's not a tank. Um, so that's uh, a great bit of kit. Even I'm going to be guilty of calling it a tank, mate. Anything that's, that's big and solid is a tank to me. <laughs> yep. you, you call it a tank, and anyone in uh, Royal Tank Regiment will go absolutely yep. potty. I'm going to apologise to you right now if you're out there from the Royal Tank Regiment. It's a tank, all right? Yeah, it's a ba baby tank, baby <laughs> yeah. tank. So, um, no, that, that's, that's immense fun to drive. That's got the, uh, the J60 petrol engine in it, so I've got my H licence, so I tear around the village and that and go to the pub or Morrison's to pick up some milk. Um, what else have we got? So there's 1953 um, Willis Jeep, uh, which is, uh, because it's not World War II, and, and a lot of the, the, the later ones are done up as World War II, it's the wrong markings. We've done that as a, a MASH Jeep, if you remember the TV series. Yeah, 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 so yeah, 4077, yeah. so that, that looks stunning. Um, 1939 Egypt Army Staff Car, which is uh, done up as bomb disposal. Wow. Um, there's a... Uh, there's a uh, Honda RS250 parachute regiment bike, and I said P-Reg. There's a, uh, a German Nazi bike with sidecar, um, and a, a load of quads in the back garden. So we got a uh, yeah. Uh, There's a fair old collection, isn't there? And inside your house, again, is testament to your love of things military, because it's like a small arsenal in there, isn't it? Very much, yeah. There, I think there's about <laughs> 40 uh, d acts and riffs and all sorts of other stuff, and probably about 3,000 items of World War II I'm just history. waiting for the bloke who tries to break into your place one day. It's going to run an absolute crooked mile, isn't he? I, I think so. They're looking through the window, <laughs> see rocket launchers leaning up against the side of the walls, <laughs> and then be off. So... <laughs> So that, that that was one of the, the the main points that led to uh, the interest in Ukraine, um, because I, I go to the military shows as as you do, yeah. And last year, uh, Odyssey Military Odyssey, one of the two best shows with um, uh, the guys over at Capel, um, and there were a couple of Ukrainian guys there, supported by um, Damon, uh, who's one of the yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, other yeah, yeah, was, yeah, good yeah, lad, was there, and um, they had some bits for for sale, and uh, they were fundraising for. Ukraine, so some bits of uh, Russian uniform, um, but of particular interest to me, they had a drone, one of the very first drones that was uh, being used in Ukraine, and I'll, I'll show you in a second, but whenever you like, yeah. um, and they were after a donation, so I thought, actually, that's quite interesting, it's current history, um, it's outside of my field of area, but as, as, as the UK, we were doing a huge amount to support Ukraine, I'm yeah. so proud yeah. of, of what our government, what Boris did at the time to yeah. stand by Ukraine. We were giving them Enlaw two weeks before the invasion started, the full-scale invasion. 
So it, it, the, the support we'd given that country is, is immense, and I'm really proud about that, um, and wanted to help. So I, I got my uh, checkbook out and gave them a, a big donation, far, far more than what it was probably worth, and kept in touch with them. And over the course of the next six months, was uh, any surplus profit from the business was just donating it to buy kit they needed. So they're very much supporting uh, a couple of the military units. Uh, you say kit they need, is this medical kit? What sort of kit you've been helping out to get? Anything or, or and everything. Was it, in the beginning, it started off with medical kit and everything. Uh, absolutely everything. At the, at the start of this, Ukraine's armed forces were about 100,000. They're now a million. So they've had to have tenfold the equipment. Yeah, that's more than what they had on the stores, and that's for sure. Ab- absolutely, yeah. So wh- whatever they've been able to get from anywhere, so boots, uh, DPM, uh, MTP, rucksacks, night vision, rifle scopes, medical trauma uh, for first aid, um, vehicles, you know, I've, I've, I've bought and sent on one-way trips probably three or four vehicles now, um, and, and these things are invaluable because they, they've had to literally grow tenfold in terms of their resource. And with that, they need everything, computers, vehicles, yeah. clothing, food. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about the, one of the units in particular in a second, yeah. uh, Tsunami, who will come up a few times, who we've uh, very much aligned ourselves with. Okay. So this is really donations to help them get going and uh, buy kit. And then there was a conversation about maybe I'll take the next vehicle over, which is what happened. And then I've I've got drawn into it. I've really got drawn into so, it. So tell us about that first trip then, because there must have been something on that first trip. When I will tell you what, guy, you ain't you ain't stopping here. You're going to keep going with this stuff. Well, it, it was it was. Uh, I tell you what, it was an experience. Um, it, it's it was. If anything, it was Mr. Bean goes to the war zone for the first time. <laughs> that the, there were there were absolute. There were a couple of complete clusterfucks on it. So a uh, very harsh learning curve. Let's hear it. Come on, because I, 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 I want warts and all. Okay, all right. So this goes back to February this year. And uh, the timing for that was very much around um, the one-year anniversary of, you can't say the invasion of Ukraine, because that happened in 2014. That was with the Crimea, Crimea. stuff, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. don't say to the Ukrainian, it's the one-year anniversary. The, the one-year anniversary is... It was 2015. Yeah, 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 so yeah, this yeah, is yeah. the one-year anniversary of the full-scale invasion. So yeah. 24th of February, 2023. And between a group of seven or eight British MPs and a load of other volunteers, we decided the best place to be for the one-year anniversary of the full-scale invasion was in Kiev to show some support. Um, now, Russia are really big on marking anniversaries, so there's a real expectation that the place was going to get bombarded yeah. and hammered. Yeah. Um, but Biden had been in. We passed his vehicle going the other way on one of the motorways. So, yeah, at, at the time, Boris had been in. Um, world leaders, Poland Poland and Ukraine were groaning under the weight of world leaders at the time we were yeah. there, which was incredible, the, the international support. And I think because of that, Putin decided he didn't have the bollocks to do anything and try to uh, assassinate a, a head of state from somewhere. So the, uh, the trip we were taking across was generators, um, all sorts of non-lethal military equipment. There was... Uh, medical supplies, but more importantly, there were about 600 uniforms, complete uniforms, boots, trousers, jackets for a part of the, the tsunami organization. So I've got a Range Rover, as you know, and I've got a big Eiffel Williams flatbed trailer. Yeah. And um, the, the, the way that our Ukrainian friends that we support take stuff over is they put them in Euro pallets. So these are boxes one meter by one meter by 1.2 high. So I'm thinking, okay, That's well, so I, European, isn't it? it is, yeah, it is, yeah, <laughs> that is yeah. proper European, that isn't it? <laughs> it is. So, so on my eye for, I'm thinking, well, I, I know I can get four long and two wide, so that's eight boxes. But what the hell? Why don't we go too high? Yeah. So I ended up with double stacked Euro pallets on the back of the Eiffel Williams trailer, probably about eight tons worth of stuff in that trailer. So I had to change the brake pads and the Range Rover when we got back, and um, so the, the whole thing was full packed packed with military equipment for these guys um, and for the journey down wanted to protect it so it was safe against the rain so you know, black shrink wrap or something like that pallet wrap yeah. I thought fuck it I'm sure I can get this in blue and I'm sure I can get this in yellow so we wrapped the top half of the pallets in uh, blue for the for the top half of the flag yeah, and yeah, the bottom yeah. half in yellow <laughs> and we ended up with this huge box that's pretty much the size of a shipping container following the Range Rover down the road, so 3,000 miles. In yellow and blue. In yellow and blue. <laughs> yellow and blue. I, I, I tell you what, petrol stations, people came up, came up and they donated some cash. They were giving money. The, the, the support we were getting, people bipping the horn on the way. Um, we had one person in uh, Germany who, who didn't give such a generous uh, gesture, so there, there was a little bit of anti-sport there. But no, So we drove all the way across, and um, I've got to say, towing eight-ton worth of trailer behind a three-and-a-half-ton Range Rover. 
you're going past the lorries and you get the wash of the lorries. It was the most intense fraught yeah, drive imagine. I've ever yeah, had. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So by the time you've gone all the way through Europe, nervous about the police and wave ridges, but then you get into the Ukrainian border. And so we went to Lviv, then to Kiev, and then down to Odessa, where at that point I had an empty trailer. But some of the dramas on the way. Um, did you know to take a trailer into Ukraine, that trailer has to have its own unique number plate? What, so aside to the vehicle number plate? Yes. So you've got to have it. Oh, right, okay. Uh, I didn't. With, with that, <laughs> with, without that, you can't get in. So we, we had to do a, a little bit of uh, triggery pokery with that. Um, Manufacture one. So, something on those lines, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and it was helped because they really wanted the stuff that was on the trailer. So they ended up using the, the chassis number on the trailer and just creating some paperwork for us. But it, it was a palava. Um, you can actually get from DVLA a unique number plate for your own trailer. It's twenty six quid. Um, so that process does exist in the UK, but I'd, I'd never heard of it. No, so, I'm, no, no. You're, well, you're educating me. I'm going to tell you. And one, one of the learning curves. One of the very steep learning curves. I think the other one was the um, the Polish at the border crossings, and, and I, I don't understand this. Um, Poland are terrified about what's going on in Ukraine. They see it as a big risk for them. Um, and when the full scale invasion occurred, they were ready to go into Ukraine and create a buffer zone between their border and the Russians if it went completely wrong. They are terrified about the prospects of stability in Ukraine. For whatever reason, getting across the border through Poland into Ukraine is just hard work. Yeah. It's um, the, the paperwork, the bureaucracy, um, that there's no compassion or, or, or love from them. It's, it's, everyone who I've spoken to, and I know a huge number of people now who go back and forth, the one thing they find draining is the uh, the border crossing, coming in or going back out. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done it myself. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I get that. It's, it, it is hard work, isn't it? Yeah. But once you're in there and you meet these wonderful people who are fighting for their country, the determination, the, the defiance. I think you start smiling as soon as you say that. There, you there's do. obviously a fondness that you've built up with these people. Absolutely. and and and, and But it's so mutual. Uh, you, you, you'll have seen in the, the papers and the press the, the amount of money that each country has given. And America's given that much money. And we're, we're, I think we're second on the list. We're something down here. Yeah. And then I think at one point we've given more than Europe had. Um, but the affinity that the Ukrainians have for the British people, for the United Kingdom people, is number one on their list. Yeah, America have given vast amounts of money, but if you talk to anyone in Ukraine about uh, what's going on, they they are so so grateful and supportive of the British for yeah. the stuff that's been been done there. In Ukrainians, you know, the second most common number plate is a British vehicle. Um, if you want to find a second-hand double crew car pickup in this country, you've had it. You're fine. They're, they're all out there. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, the, the amount of support that's going on, and I, I, so some of the people I've met are doing incredible things out there to, to help these guys. So your first trip, you, you, you learned a few lessons off of that, and so you came home and you must have thought, right, what can I do now? Is that Was that the case? And you just Pretty much, yeah. Went out and bought a van. Um, so we've got a huge van. The, the Range Rover, oh, my God, the fuel economy. Taking that thing there and back, um, I, I think it's about... Two thousand pound worth of fuel to get that car there and back. I can imagine, yeah. Comfortable yeah, journey. Cost but... you twenty quid to get to the shops, in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> get yourself down to Odessa, in it. Absolutely. So, so made the mistake of taking it for a second time with another trailer on the back. And by this time, we'd bought a uh, a big uh, Citroen Relay, but, but height to length for. Yeah. It's the Tardis. You can get an incredible amount of this stuff in there. Yeah. So, um, on the second trip over, we had to fill the Range Rover up four times for every one time in the van, so the Range Rover's not going back again. That's, yeah, that's yeah, grounded. Range Rover's days are done. That's, that's grounded, yeah. It's, it's spent a lot of time in Ukraine, but it's, it's not going there again. So, um, yeah, every time we, we, we could find enough stuff to, uh, to take across. Um, as a business, I fund the total cost of the fuel and everything else to get there. Um, but we've got a, a great network of people in, in the Hampshire area and beyond who will connect, uh, collect military stuff, um, medical stuff, um, and anything. Uh, as long as it's good quality, it's in date. Particularly if it's battlefield trauma, so dressings, medicines, syringes. Um, I've taken over all sorts of other stuff, prescription drugs, morphine. Um, taken over some stuff I probably shouldn't have, but you know, I, it's going in the right direction, all in the, all in the right corner, reason, and I'm I'm very that I sleep very happily with that. So the, the tsunami people, let's let's get let's get a bit more about them because that's sort of like become your little niche over there, isn't it? Really, the, 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 that's that's your area of concentration, shall we say? It is definitely. Um, you know, you, you start off in peace with a, an army of 100,000 and you need to end up with a million. You, you know what the command structure looks like. You can't just put 900,000 people 
into a structure that's geared up for 100,000 yeah. and expect it to function. You, you need a you need a bigger command structure. You need infrastructure. You need IT. You need bases. You need space. You need everything. Um, so under something called the Zelensky Initiative, they looked around the country and, and looked at what other organizations do we have that we can turn into military units. So across the country, there are border force units, there are police units, um, and for, for the group that I'm supporting, which are based in Odessa, which is a beautiful city, um, they are effectively what used to be Ukraine border force and police force in Odessa. Okay. So because of the war, and the massive reduction in freight and shipping, border force are doing not a lot out there. Um, because of the the nationalistic um, sense of the community, you know, the, the mafia has been a big problem in Ukraine. They're, they're no longer a problem. A lot of the, the emails you used to get saying, we've got some money from an American general or someone, give us this money and you'll get however many million. A lot of that used to come, come from Ukraine. Um, but all of the mafia effort now is targeted against Russia. So... There isn't really a problem with crime in Odessa. It's a safer place to be in London, frankly. I can imagine, yeah. Absolutely I mean, safer. Everybody's looking out, aren't they? Everyone's, yeah. everyone's got yeah. this fixation on, rightly so, the Russians, isn't it? Very much. So there's an organisation called uh, Tsunami, which is Tsunami Regiment, and uh, the guys in uh, Odessa are Fury Brigade. And they're, they're effectively what is a 300-strong static <laughs> police-backed force a lot carry firearms, a lot of them had, param- uh, had military experience as part of their training, because that's, that's what you do in Ukraine. Yep. But they've had to turn from a 300-strong static force to a 3,000-strong mobile force. Wow. So that's command structure, that's training of people, that's vehicles, it's mobile catering, it's mobile food, it's mobile it's accommodation. Food, it? it's, it's, everything, yeah, yeah. everything. So we, we, we've kind of latched onto these guys. And because it, it's a bit tricky, there's, there's an organization called ITCC, International Defense Coordination Center. So that's where all of the military units in Ukraine can request Western kit. Because they're a police unit and they're part of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, they fall outside of that process. So they don't get access to the big, interesting, sexy stuff that Western countries are donating and are being channeled through ITCC in Germany. So they... They, they need absolutely everything. In, in fact, I think at one point, um, probably two of their favourite vehicles that they're using down there were ones I'd taken over, the Wimmick being one of them. Oh, wow, okay. So you're having a huge impact for them? Uh, a very small part of the jigsaw puzzle of all of the people in the UK that are having a huge impact f- throughout These Ukraine. These two tsunami troops, to put it in perspective, they are on a proper front line, aren't they? They are scrapping hard, aren't they? Oh, for sure. They are yeah. clearing trenches. They are working with mortar artillery. They are... Uh, yeah, they're so it's not like a home guard. It's not like you know. I think sometimes people get the impression, oh, it's a bit of a home guard thing going on there, and we've turned the policemen into into soldiers. It's not, is it? They are on a proper front line. They are actually, you know, yep. cold steel ramming it into people's chests. They are. Yep. Yeah, they're they're defending their country, and they are utterly fucked off. They are determined, and they are going to get their land back. And they are they're right up there with um, all of the other units. And as you say, they they are they're, they're fighting in the trenches some of the videos i get through from these guys every now and again yeah, are heartbreaking well, I've seen some absolutely of them, heartbreaking in, incredible and the other thing is of course and i noticed this when i went over there you know poland was filling up with, with women and children and so you go into these towns and there's, there's, there's no women and children there is there that's a really strange feeling isn't it it's like it's incredible isn't it? it is um actually there are two halves of maybe three halves of ukraine 70 percent of the country has never been occupied by russia recently um it's life is normal there shops are open yeah well, is going in afghanistan you know you could go to a place in afghanistan where nothing had changed absolutely yeah you could go up to other places in afghanistan where it was absolute full-on you know stuff was falling out of the sky all day and all yep. that sort of stuff so that is the nature of a country at war isn't it there's, it is there's places you can go which are completely just turn on here very much and then you go to the 15 percent which has been liberated so for example there's Irpin and busha up in the north by uh, by kiev um, and the devastation there is, is awful. The, the press have well documented that with civilian deaths and unmarked graves and so on. But then you go down to somewhere like Kherson, where it's also up against the, the front line, and there's mortar and there's artillery landing all the way around you. Every 20 seconds you hear something going off. Kherson had a, a population of half a million. Um, when I was there last, it had a population of 50,000. Probably. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Three, three quarters of that 50,000 were military. The, the population's just gone. Yeah. And um, a lot of that would have been dead as well, wouldn't it? A lot of people have been killed there. The loss of life has been absolutely phenomenal, hasn't it? It's just incredible. It's just, you can't even get your head around it here. No, and I, I think 
God willing, they get down to the south coast. Once they get somewhere like Mariupol, um, satellite imagery has a lot of evidence about some very, very big mass graves. So there are currently one million unaccounted for Ukrainians. That's a lot of people. I mean, that's that's a lot of people. If you think Old Trafford owns holds 70,000 people, say, for instance, or Wembley holds 90,000 people, that's 10 times what's in Wembley on a cup final day missing. Yep. Yep. And, that's uh, incredible. Get your head around that. That's ridiculous, isn't it? And, and that's not people who've gone across the border into Poland and they don't know where they are because it, they know they're in Poland. So yeah. that, that's peop- the, the, the people that are left into the EU or, or neighbouring countries, they're not that one million <laughs> because they know that they're safe. That's one million people on the southern uh, area of uh, Ukraine and the eastern end who have gone into to Russian territory and taken to Russian territory and no one knows where they are. So a lot of people are talking about this war and they're saying, you know, it's gone back to World War Two trenches and all that sort of stuff. But there's a different aspect on it now, isn't there? And there's an airborne element, which is sort of like completely bedding itself in on this war, as it were. Wasn't it? We've seen it elsewhere, but this war really has taken the drone stuff to a next level, hasn't it? Can you tell me a little bit about the drone warfare and what you've seen over there? Absolutely. And, and as you say, the, the, the World War Two element, this is World War Two fighting on the ground. Because no one's got air superiority for fixed-wing aircraft or rotary-wing aircraft. It's World War II fighting with Cold War vehicles. Cold War vehicles. We're, we're dusting off 1970s CVRTs yeah, and sending T-62s back. T-62s and Absolutely. Yeah. all Ru- that sort of stuff. R- Russia's stuff is going backwards in age, and our stuff is, that we're sending across is going, thankfully, for the Ukrainians forwards in age. Um, but yeah, World War II uh, tactics with Cold War vehicles, but there are four game changers. First one is Starlink. Um, Musk is a fruitcake. He's an absolute nutty person with Twitter, I don't know, like, but I, I, I can't say anything bad about the guy because the provision of Starlink for uh, Ukraine, which has given them immense communication, secure communication amongst each other's absolute game changer, particularly for the sort of volume of data for drones and for video imagery. So that's the first one. The second one is drones. Um, in the press, I've never heard the phrase drone air superiority. I haven't heard that phrase from anyone, but that's absolutely what this is all about. Right here first on Force Radio. <laughs> first on Force Radio. Drone air superiority is everything out there. Yeah. Um, if you know what the enemy are doing, um, you, you've, you've got a chance. Um, and the you know, Ukrainian drone operator will go out with five drones in the morning and typically come back with three. There's jamming, there's GPS interference, there's all sorts of things going on. Yeah. But maybe chat about that a little bit more. Um, the way that they are using IT to integrate the drone intelligence into the battle plan, into information for targeting packages for artillery, um, and then using the drone footage to monitor the accuracy of the first hit. Um, they, they've got some amazing stories to tell when this is all over about how they've incorporated so quickly the use of drone technology into, into warfare. And of course, the fourth one is, is modern Western weapons for the units that get them. Um, high Mars, other stuff, um, Challenger, Leopard, and, and now and the F-14. stuff that combats them as well, you know, the handheld stuff, the, the rocket launchers yeah. and all the stuff that they've been trained on, yeah. which hopefully are doing a cracking job against Cold War vehicles, certainly. Very much. Well, the, for the Battle of Kiev, um, right at the start of, of, of this uh, this invasion, sort of early part, uh, late, late part of February, early March last year, remember all those tanks lined up on the road waiting to come into Kiev? Yeah, and the so big on. column. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the, there are two things that saved Kiev, and because Kiev was saved, that kept Ukraine going. The first one was uh, that between the Americans with Javelin and ourselves with Enlaw, we'd shipped out a huge amount of that stock because our governments could see it was going to happen. It was there ready for, for yeah. the start. Um, the second one was the Kiev Drone Operators Club, believe it or not. <laughs> and when when the invasion happened, the Kiev Drone Operators Club and, and every other drone operators club around the country, they charged their batteries, they got their remotes, they paired the phones with the drones, and they drove to the front lines and went up to the army guys and said, do you want to see where the enemy are? And, and the Russian... Uh, That's a massive initiative, isn't it? It is. That's sort of like, we're going, I can help. Yeah. I'm coming. Absolutely. You know, they're d- <laughs> out there to do the Running thing. towards it at the next level, isn't it? That's yeah, they I were. love that. Love it. They were. And, and they came up to these army guys and, and said, uh, yeah, would you like to see where the Russians are? And the army guys went, yeah. <laughs> so they <laughs> plugged the batteries in, switched the drones on, Flew them to the front line, weaving in and out of the trees, and you know, the army guys were looking at the control units, saying, and they could see how far they could quickly advance safely before they had to dig in, and then they were able to use the drone technology with Enlaw and Javelin to take out Russian vehicles, and they were very clever about it. They took out the ones at the front, and they took out the ones at the back, and they did nothing with the ones in the middle, and they knowing that they were going to be stuck there, and then the Russians, because it was cold in February, 
ran out of fuel, trying to keep warm. And then they got out of the vehicles, walked away and left them. The biggest donor of tanks, of armoured vehicles to Ukraine, is the Russian Federation. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible, isn't it? That is incredible. But, but that's, that, 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 that is sharp thinking as well, isn't it? You know, they, uh, they've literally been faced with a situation and turned it around. Yeah. A bit of clever thinking and a few people coming up from nowhere going, so well, I've got a drone, how about that? Utterly, and, and these guys are so innovative. They're, they're innovative, they're adaptable, they're flexible, they're inventive. Um, yeah, we, we, we did some really fun stuff in World War II in terms of inflatable tanks and, and stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a great book actually called Winston's Wizards, which talks about all the skullduggery that we but did Winston in World War II. Winston was massive for thinking outside the box, wasn't he? They, they, How can we do this another way? What can we do? What have we got that they haven't got? Where can we take this another direction? Now, Special Forces was born like that. Do you know uh, what I mean? Absolutely. And the Ukrainians are, are implementing that to the highest standard, and it, it's incredible to see. Some, some of the stuff I've seen out there is just amazing. But when this is over and they have one, they're going to have one hell of a story to tell about. Well, I think about we need, to, we need to head over there and tell that story <laughs> for them, I think, at some sort of point, guy. Do you know what I mean? As soon Absolutely. as we can, and we don't give Absolutely. anything away by doing so. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, there's so much there which is just astonishing and amazing. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it just can't say it, but it's, it's, it's just incredible. Um, but yeah, so the, the Keeve Drone Operators Club um and and law saved drone operators yeah. that's just so sort of like random yeah. minute do you know what i mean yeah, absolutely it's, it saved key from from yeah that and what we all thought in the west was going to be just a three-day um theft of ukraine so but also the, the ukrainians were they used a lot of sensible judgment and reserve they didn't destroy the, all the tank column which they could have done yeah. out of anger and frustration they, they said no we're, we're going to see how many of these we can make and yeah, the, yeah, 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 and, yeah. And Mate, that, is, that is just brilliant. It's genius, isn't it? It is, it yeah. Is genius. Yeah. The, 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 you're right. There would have been a temptation to go. I'll tell you what, yeah. Batu, batu, batu. Yeah. How, how many, how yeah. many UK or American uh, Apache pilots, or, or uh, for any gunship that's got surface uh, air to surface capability, was looking at that TV footage of all those tanks lining up and having a wet dream thing? God, just had, <laughs> and you see yeah. them all blowing up everywhere yeah, in Armageddon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't do that. They, they were, they were very careful. They were very cautious. Now they've turned the barrels around and they've pointed them 180 degrees in the other direction. Yeah, Fantastic! It's, it's great. It's great. Amazing people. But the other thing I was going to say: there is a fifth element. You said there's four. There is. Oh, I think there's four, and I think you will agree with me. The propaganda war is being won hands down by the, by the Ukrainians, isn't it? You're you're you're, you're dead right. The um, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, or yeah. some, some of the videos they do are ever so clever. Yeah. Um. The uh. But most importantly, uh, President Zelensky. I, I've I've got to say. Um, but yeah, when you, he's just been insane. He, I mean, personality of the internet ever, probably at the moment, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? I know. And, and, and what a misjudgment of the whole Western world. Because when, when, when Ukraine elected a comedian as president, it, was, come on, it, it, it seemed a, a bit of a joke, didn't it? Yeah. But the guy's been dead serious about reforming the country, about stamping out with corruption. Uh, before the war, he'd had a, a big program for rebuilding the roads. Um, but the way that he has, has managed to... Um, Form relationships with Western countries, and some of the speeches he's he's, he's made. I, I I stayed up for the one in Congress. I stayed up. Uh, I watched the one in in our Parliament in Westminster. The, the, those speeches are without a doubt the finest speeches of, of this century, and, and probably in the in the, top, the way, handful of the top ones of the last century. The way he conducts himself as well. He looks the part. He's cut round in nothing but a t-shirt and combat fatigues, and he just looks. He looks alley, doesn't he? Do you know what I mean? Folks are like. I want to be him, you know what I mean? Because he is cutting around. Yeah. I mean, I know Putin's always been up for this riding horses bareback and giving it big licks and, you know, how tough am I? I'm a judo man, do you know what I mean? He's just made him look like a muppet, isn't he? Yes, yeah. Do you yeah. know what I mean? In the man stakes, you made him look a muppet, haven't you? No, for sure. And, and actually, the, the Ukrainians are doing that as well. Should I put a few bits on the table? Let's, let's yeah. grab a few bits on the table yeah, and then I'll you. Because the Ukrainian sense of humour over all this is absolutely incredible, isn't it? So I, I, I don't know. Is this a zoom-in job? You can go so the camera over there. there. So, so here, here's, here's exhibit A about the, the wicked wit of the Ukrainians. <laughs> so um, and, and, and actually, China are the winners as well, because China is selling stuff to both sides. I bet China are, China, <laughs> China are making that. China are making these. China are your friends. <laughs> China are your friends. Yeah, yeah. Putin toilet rolls made in, made in China, sold in Ukraine. So, so that, that's, that's one of those ones. And what what I've got here, I've got a second one which you can keep in your offices. So there, there's oh, there's nice for you for the uh, uh, another much. another Superb. China Putin toilet roll. We shall, we shall treasure that. We shall, we shall treasure that. That should be put in the put into our interest room. Right. What else have we got down here? So 
Um, th this was from Kiev, and this is in one of the markets in <laughs> Kiev. I don't know if you can see that. I can see that. So it's, it's a Putin pen holder. <laughs> that is just so unflattering. And <laughs> they've even given him a tail. <laughs> So the, the wicked wit of the Ukrainians is, is just outstanding. That is honking. I've got to have a butcher's at that. That is honking. That is, look, look, hang on, I'll hold it to my camera there. Look, there you go. That is proper honking. And if you can see the tail on the back, it doesn't look like it. it looks, no, I'm not even going to go there. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's a very good pen holder. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, of course, this is the Moscow. Yep. Um, f for a country without a navy to sink another country's capital ship. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Mate, that, is a, that is a good effort, isn't it? That, that, that is a great effort. That is a good effort. And that's a bottle of vodka. And Yeah, bottle of vodka. I, I, I'll let you show, show the camera. And on the inside, the the ship that they sank, <coughs> well, they've quite neatly put it underneath vodka this time. There you go. It's at the bottom of the vodka bottle inside there on the label. You might not be able to pick up on that, but I will I will p post a picture on our socials of that for sure, for definite, because that is cool. So when, when they are uh, the, uh, Snake Island... Uh, you, you might remember very early in the war, Snake Island, which had about seven or eight Ukrainian troops on it, and the, the, yeah. the Moscow came up. Uh, this is Russian warship versus Russian warships. You'll surrender or we'll bomb you. And the reply from the Ukrainians was, Russian warship, go fuck yourself. That's right. It was, wasn't it? <laughs> so the next day, oh. you, you know, like we have traffic indicators on the motorways and stuff with yeah. different texts. On, the next day, every sign throughout Ukraine was, go fuck yourself. Really? In tribute to those seven or eight... <laughs> Ukrainian guys. Oh, it, was gutsy, wasn't it? it was absolute gutsy. It was wasn't gutsy. It? And, Next level. And no one knew what happened to them. They were all presumed to be dead and lost. Yeah. So the, the Ukrainian government said, right, we're, we're going to do a, a postage stamp to commemorate um, the guys on, on Snake Island and opened it to the public for a sketch and an ideas. And I think it was, guy, it was a guy called Boris. I think it might have been Yurovsky, but it's definitely called Boris. He, he came up with the stamp that was selected, which was basically the image on the, uh, the front of the bottle. Of the back of a, um, a Ukrainian soldier, yeah, sticking up two fingers to the Moscow in the background, <laughs> for for one country to produce a postage stamp of the, one of their soldiers telling another country to go fuck yeah, themselves yeah, 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 and, yeah. and put it, it, it abs absolutely genius, absolute genius. Yeah. It's, it's something it, it almost sort of like epitomizes the spirit that that we've seen from people over there, which has been incredible, isn't it? it they're defiant, they're determined, and they're really fucked off, and they yeah. The, 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 the the motivation that gives their frontline forces compared to a Russian guy who doesn't know why he's there, who was told that they were going to be greeted Possibly with flags and flowers. doesn't even want to be there. doesn't even want to be there. It's not, <laughs> not fighting for his cause. He's fighting for his country's cause. And you know, with Twitter and, and stuff, while media is controlled in Russia, um, with Twitter and stuff, other, other social media platforms, the, the Russian guys in the front line know what's going on all over the place. Yeah, of course they do. And and that's, I mean, that's another thing that's being bombarded towards them. They must be seeing some of this stuff thinking, wow, wasn't what I signed up for, because they're not being told that, are they? So No, totally. And, and, and when generals get sacked, and then other people go missing, and people fall out of windows, um, and, and this victory parade for Prigozhin, when he uh, headed up towards Moscow, and then bottled it 100, yeah. 100 yeah, kilometers yeah, yeah, or so yeah, yeah. away from, from the border... You know, the, the confusion, the lack of confidence that it gives in their own forces. Um, yeah, the, and the Ukrainians will joke that they're sitting there eating popcorn as all this unfolds. And honest to God, they are. They're, 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 it's, it's, it's just it's just, just a well, crisis. It war. almost gets to the point that you feel sorry for the Russian soldier, doesn't you? It's not, it's not his fault. And there is, I know you've got a couple of other bits and pieces which we'll look at earlier. There is, a, there is a massive, massive human cost on both sides of the fence with this, isn't there? There is the um, yeah the, the the human cost on the Ukrainian side is is utterly tragic because it's it's, it's civilian and military um, and the civilian loss is indiscriminate by by Russia. Yeah. From the Russian side, it's this is a little bit difficult. Some of the behaviour of the Russian soldiers falls well below. Way short of where it should have been, and way short of what the what, what you know there are rules in place for war, and we all know that, don't you? There's the Geneva Convention yeah. and all that sort of stuff, and some of it has been. Yeah. So some of it has been subhuman. Falling, falling short of that. Some of it has been subhuman in behaviour. Yeah. And, and the trouble I, is, as soon as you go into something like that, everybody is going to get tired with the same brush, aren't they? You know what I mean? Especially as you yeah. know, you know, people looking in are going to see the worst bits. You're never going to see the best bits. You're going to see the worst bits, aren't you? No, for sure. But I, I've, I've got to say, the, the Ukrainians, I think, have have tried to show themselves to be a modern, Western, honest, calculating. Um, calculating on that. Let's face it; they are the most battle-ready army in the world. 
Yeah, huge. I mean, as a, as a country, they, you know, they, 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 they're at war, aren't they? They're yeah. In their own back garden. Yep. Most battle ready. They may not be the best equipped. They're certainly the most motivated. Yeah. And for, 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 for our armies in the West, looking in at Ukraine, we are not equipped to fight that sort of war. The amount we're going to have to do to learn about drone technology and embedding it right the way across all of our units, that, you know, that the value of, of drone and surveillance um, or the ability to drop ordnance, it, it, is, it is everything out there. Having seen it firsthand, absolutely you, I mean, you brought, you've got this, the small Russian one, which we're going to do a piece on later, but you brought a big one back as well, didn't you? Uh, yep, there's a uh, there's, there's Norland 10, uh, which is a, a big Russian drone. It's uh, very much based about electronic warfare. So this is surveillance. It's capturing the mobile phone signal. Um, this thing will pick up your IMER on your phone, even if your phone is switched off. Your phone's always giving you Mobile phones are a massive thing over there, aren't they? For getting you caught and getting you in trouble. Like that. The weekend I was there, Lviv got bombed because there was a build-up of Brit mobile phones there. So yep. it's yep. a huge problem for mobile phones, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, very much. The, 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 the data you can gather from it is, is colossal. And once you know one or two phone numbers or one or two key people, um, if, if you're gathering that data, then you can start to see who they're talking to. And a, a general doesn't normally talk to privates. A general will normally talk to other generals or colonels. So you can then build yeah. up a bit of a map of the, the, the structure of the, uh, the, the where everyone is and what they're doing. Yeah. So electronic warfare is a, a real problem out there uh, for both sides, for both sides. Um, but with Starlink, the Ukrainians have far better communication. Yeah. Um, the Russians are relying on whatever mobile phone network is intact in the area and other, other forms of the Soviet communication. What are your plans now? With the Ukraine, are you going to ca continue to do what you're doing? Are you going to continue with trips into Ukraine and, and help wherever you can? Absolutely. Um, the uh, say just got back two days ago from the last trip. Um, the, the the guys who are supporting who are tsunami. Oh, here so this is tsunami and uh, Führer Brigade. So th this is our unit that we we work really hard to support. Um, they they came across some funding uh, and a an anonymous American billionaire um, who he, he said, what do you need? Wow. And they said, we want a truck and some vehicles. And he said, yeah, okay, well, tell, tell me what we want and I'll, I'll look at it. So I got a, uh, a phone call from uh, from a friend and said, uh, they said, yeah, we, we've got a donor who's going to give some money. Um, can you do a proposal for us? We, we, we want a lorry and we want, you know, we've spoken about quad bikes. Let's see if we can get three quad bikes. And I said, yeah, okay, fine. What sort of lorry? And we went back and forth and worked out eventually you need to have a high ab, 10 ton capacity, so that was yep. 26 ton truck, three axle. So I'm thinking, I need to go find a driver at some point. Um, so picked out on that one, put together a bit of a proposal and said, what sort of money is he offering? You know, is, is it 10,000? Is it 50,000? Is it 100,000? And they said, well, we don't know. Just, just come up with a proposal. So anyway, did a proposal, sent it off to these guys with some photographs and explained how having this, this builder's merchant's lorry with a big high ab on the back. Yeah. They don't even have a truck the same age without one. So th this gives them a resource to move big quantities of materials around very quickly. The quad bikes for casualty evacuation, for uh, distribution yeah, of energy. Invaluable bit of kit. Invaluable bit of kit. Bring in am arms and munitions forward and bring in casualties and stuff back. Utterly. Um, and rations and all sorts of go on them. The other thing about quad bike, small, quick, from the drone, it's a small target. Yeah. It's not an attractive target. They want armored vehicles. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, you're yeah, far yeah. more likely to get in and out and be gone before they've even spotted you. And I'll tell you about two minutes, 40 seconds later, because that's an important one. So the, the drones, uh, the, the quad bikes and the trailers, absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, literally, um, myself, Ollie, um, James, who's done a huge amount of supporting uh, getting the vehicles across. Um, Wednesday night last week, we got in the truck, <laughs> drove to Ukraine. Um, and we were in Odessa, uh, dropped off the lorry. That was on Saturday night. Yeah, Saturday night, unloaded on the Sunday, night train back from Odessa to Lviv, then a, a taxi from Lviv to Krakow, um, ready to fly back on the Monday night, um, and then National Air Traffic Control fell over in the UK. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> How's your luck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then, it, yeah, the, the, you remember the film Planes, Trains and Automobiles with yeah, John yeah, Candy yeah, yeah, and yeah, Steve yeah, Martin? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was like that. It, 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 just, it, just, it was like that at the end. We ended up getting another taxi to go from uh, Krakow to Warsaw uh, at, at three in the morning to get what was the last two flights out of Poland to the UK wow. before waiting until this, this Friday, Saturday to come up. So we're, we're Tuesday today, Wednesday today. We, we've, we, we got back on uh, yesterday morning, Tuesday morning. We would have had to wait another five days. 
Um, at one point, we were looking at going out and buying the cheaper Spaniel we could. And just driving it. And just driving it, yep. yeah, 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 find, yeah, find, yeah, yeah. There were two of us, find three other people, 500 quid each, let's find a 1,500 quid per sat, um, 1,000 pound for fuel and for ferry and for insurance and just rag the fuck out of it and just drive around the <laughs> clock until we got back. At push one point, we were about to do the that. Cliffs at Dover. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that would have been a, an interesting invention in itself. It was, yeah, if it, we're going to get the job done. But yeah. we, we found a taxi that would take us to uh, Warsaw Airport. That was a four-hour drive. So we, we, it was very, very tight to leave there and, and then check in at Warsaw. And of course, we, we'd filled ourselves up for duty-free, hadn't we, at the airport. And we were now back out of the airport. We, between us, we had about eight litres worth of vodka, Polish vodka, which is great stuff. And we'd now gone from air side at Krakow. <laughs> oh, God, we're going to lose all of this. Um, but fortunately, Warsaw, they, when, when we got there, because it was in sealed bags, they let us take it in, which was fantastic. That was, <laughs> that was the one good thing about that. So we got halfway towards Warsaw. And then the driver pulls into the uh, one of the petrol stations and says, I've got to plug the car in. Ugh. What? <laughs> I've got to plug the car in. We looked around, oh, shit, it's a Tesla. <laughs> My <laughs> battery was down at 12%. So he plugs it in. We're looking at the, the clock thinking, oh, my God, we've got to check in. It's going to be frantic. And we're looking at the, the time on the clock going down. We're looking at the power gauge on the Tesla slowing going up. Um, so after an hour, we're, 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 oh, God. Anyway, we get going, and we arrive just in time to check in at the airport. And, we yeah, we made it back yesterday. Super. So all, all frantic last-minute stuff. So you're going to keep going with this. Where do you actually see... In your opinion, the conflict going, and how long do you think it will go on for? Because those are the two questions I get asked all the time, and my knowledge isn't anywhere near compared to what yours is. Yeah, yeah, it's a difficult one. Um, uh, I'll start off with what I hope is going to happen. Okay. We're not going to see it go on too far to risk a Trump presidency in the USA, because the guy's another fruitcake on this planet. And he stated his intention that he would stop the war in, in two or three days. The only people who've got the right to negotiate any end are the Ukrainians. Yeah. We, we must stay behind them. If we get this wrong, uh, countries like China looking at Taiwan, any other country with territorial ambitions, we have got Absolutely. to get this right. They will just, they'll will, just thump straight in there, won't they? If we get this right, it will prevent a war somewhere, somewhere else. So yeah, it, it, well, whatever happens, it's, it's, it's ideal it's before an, the risk of an American election, which they are concerned about. Um, the they've got three months worth of good weather the most prized bit of territory for putin is crimea yeah they they firmly see themselves went there 14 years ago that's what absolutely. he's always been after that's absolutely. the jewel in the crown for him isn't it? absolutely and and there's no secret about this the the, <laughs> the the ukrainians are looking to see if they can cut the passage down cut off crimea and do a bit more damage to the curse bridge everyone can see that's what's happening if, if they manage to cut off the line down to the south coast um, Mariupol or somewhere like that and take out that bridge again then for the Russian troops that are there it doesn't matter whether it's food they run out of first or water or fuel or one form of ammunition, ammunition take any one of them away and they're fucked yeah. and that would be the most humiliating <laughs> defeat and, and that, that would be an immense thing but more importantly I think when the um, I mentioned Mariupol and the civilian mass graves um, I think when they get down there um, what would appear to be on satellite imagery, evidence of some real horrors um, may give the uh, the Western world a lot more galvanization to stand by Ukraine and to continue going until this is resolved. So, but yeah, they deserve their country back. They absolutely deserve their country yeah, back. It's, it's not, it wasn't. Yeah, that, I don't think that's ever been for, for question for me. No, you yeah, know, you've taken something that wasn't yours. Yes, very you know much. I mean? You can dress it up however you want. We never wanted NATO next door to it. We're scared of them. Do it. You can dress it up however you want. But you took something off someone else. Yeah, that's wrong. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That said, what, how, however it does end up, and let, let's let's assume it is with the success of their border being restored, one of the big challenges they, they will have. So we, we've got England, Wales, and Scotland, but we're, we're on country. Yeah. Say all of a sudden there was a dividing line between Wales and England, or England and Scotland, the, the way the population have mingled across, you'd never be able to restore that. Well, so you... Yeah. There, are, there are Russians during the Soviet USSR years. Uh, there are Russians who've moved and got jobs in Ukraine and married, and the Ukrainians who've gone the other way. So you, even if you can re-establish a, a border, th there's going to be... There's still going to be some entanglement there because yes. of the natural migration of people. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. 
That said, I've met a lot of Russians in Ukraine who've been there for many, many years, and they firmly view themselves as Ukrainian, and uh, and that's that's amazing. No, it's very difficult. Mm. Look, I'm sure we're going to do more stuff together, hundred percent. But look, thank you for for coming on. Mm, no problem. Super. Wish you massive luck with what you're doing, and I hope you know for the for the sake of Ukraine, you know you're not doing it for too much longer. To be honest, you know what I mean, because they deserve a break over there, and I think you know. It'd be great to see a resolve. Yes. Like you say, you know, yep. Things go back to normal for so many people who've had their lives absolutely ruined yep. by someone else. Th there is one thing that has to happen as well. So quite a lot of people ask me as well why, why I do do it. Um, you started off with that question yep. uh, and said there were two parts. This is the second part. So I, I think up, up at this camera here. So this is a, a court copy of the indictment of the Nazis in World War II. 1945, so the 18th of October, you can see at the bottom, I'm sure there'll be photos on, on something yeah. online. Yeah, we'll get something clearer. So this is an original court copy of the indictment of the uh, the Nazi leaders and the German organisations, and there were four crimes that they were charged with, crimes against peace, crimes against humanity, and so on. And you start to read this, and you can find this online, you start to read this, and you look at the war crimes that were committed in World War Two, and that they're identical to what's going on in Russia today. In Ukraine today, we know the Russians have taken Ukrainian children back into Russia. You know, kids up to about 12, 15 years old, embedded them with Russian families to grow up as Russian ch uh, Russian children. That the war crimes out there are identical to what's what happened in World War Two. Um, the only difference is some of the numbers, and some of those numbers are are getting pretty close. Wow! So that that's that's another reason why why we must support that country. Um, and the, the tragic thing is that Russia. USSR at the time, you know, Soviet Socialist Republics, were one of the judges against Nazi Germany. And right now they're doing the same thing to another country in Ukraine. Which is awful. Yep. Cheers, buddy. Okay. Super. Phil, thanks so much for having me on. And don't forget to do a little plug for me on the... Uh... I will 100% get all your, all your stuff in. And like I say, we'll give you as much support as we can. And hopefully we'll have you on again. No, that's brilliant. Absolutely. And, you know, at some stage when this does finish... We'll head down there ourselves and go and have a butchers. Very much, yeah. And go and get some go and get some stories from the people that, you know, played it out. Yep. They'd awesome. love that.